Gregor through the Washington School District, uh, Linda Luna, as well as the superintendent for the Sacramento County Office of Education, uh, Dave Gordon. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, since we have the, the, the West Sac uh, bridge in the background that reminds us of West Sac, I'll let you, you start, Linda. Tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Thank you, Assemblymember McCarty, and for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm Linda Luna. I'm starting my sixth year as superintendent here in Washington Unified. Uh, this is my 37th year as a public ed educator. Um, and um, I am just honored to be um, the superintendent in West Sacramento. We are a very different school district and I'm so proud of our community. I'm proud of our school district. I'm proud of our employees for the great transformation that they have done in the past five years. Um, and we look forward to sharing a little bit about what we're doing uh, today with you. Okay, uh, Dave Gordon. Good afternoon, I'm Dave Gordon. And uh, as uh, Assemblyman McCarty said, I work as the uh, County Superintendent of Schools in Sacramento. And uh, in that role, our office supports our 13 school districts uh, on a number of fronts, uh, financial, uh, curriculum planning. We have a school of education, which provides uh, training and credentialing for administrators and uh, teachers uh, as well, and many, many, uh, many, many other services. Uh, direct services we provide are court and community schools. We serve students in the juvenile hall, as well as a variety of special education programs. And we also operate the Sly Park Science Camp up in uh, up in Pollock Pines, which many of uh, many of you or your kids have, uh, have been to. So happy to be here. Okay. So uh, first is maybe both of you can give a high level uh, overview of what's happening in California, what what the governor had had ordered for schools across California, and uh, and what that means for for our region. And just for everybody watching. Uh, Dave Gordon over here on our on our left here on the screen, he's a superintendent for public schools for Sacramento County, and so that's kind of the coordinating body for about you know 15 or so school districts in the Sacramento County area, such as Sacramento City School District, San Juan, El Grove, Twin Rivers, the Tomas, Robla. Uh, those are the ones in, in my area, but there are others throughout Sacramento County. And Linda, of course, is the superintendent of the school district for the West Sacramento area, the Washington School District. So Dave, uh, maybe you can start with kind of what's happening, the big picture, what was the directive from the governor and what does that mean for schools in our area and across California? Well, for the time being, the directive is that uh, school districts start with distance learning, not with in-person learning with the schools being open because of the situation relative to the increase in cases and hospitalizations uh, in the various counties in the state. So the 30 or so counties on what they call the state's monitoring list mm -hmm. are not permitted to go to uh, in-person learning until they have been off the monitoring list for a period of time. And when they get off the monitoring list, the local county health officer has to agree to the provisions that the district has made for the health and safety of students uh, and staff as well. The only uh, exception to this is there was a provision in the governor's order potentially for a waiver for elementary schools, but that waiver must be approved by the local public health officer and the state uh, Department of Public Health, and it also is to be uh, commented on and approved only in consultation with labor uh, community groups and, and other, other local interests. So the state, as we understand it, is working on more specific criteria from which local public health officers can build their local criteria for the waiver applications and we have not received those uh, as of yet. So right now, schools are closed and distance learning is, uh, is the norm. Okay, so maybe uh, Linda, if you could expand upon that and give us an outline of what a typical school day 
is going to look like mm -hmm. for for students in in the area from kindergarten through high school? Yeah, sure. So Yolo County is in the same predicament as Sacramento County, um, having to begin with distance learning because we are on the monitor. So our day of virtual learning, distance learning is going to be both synchronous and asynchronous learning for our kids. It's different than last spring because we are um, following instructional minutes by the CDE guidelines. And also we have moved to our regular rigorous instruction that we would normally be doing in the school year through standards aligned instruction, assessments, grading, all of that will be included in the both synchronous and asynchronous learning for uh, TK all the way through grade 12. Now the days look a little bit different, but in general, um, our teachers will all start at eight o'clock in the morning for 30 minutes to prepare their virtual platforms. Students will log in at 830 with their teachers. Teachers will be live uh, during instructional minutes. So for kindergarten, it's 180 minutes that our teachers will be live available and teaching with their students. Um, and then it, it varies in uh, grades one through three, four through five, middle and high school grades. Throughout the day, in each day, there is time for intervention support, enrichment support um, for small groups so that teachers can uh, do some targeted intervention. There's also time in each day in our particular school district in, in collaboration with our Washington um, Teachers Association um, for teachers for 55 minutes each day to plan together, to have time to um, have faculty meetings, and also uh, to work in grade levels and discipline content areas. So in following all of the instructional minutes, our teachers will also have a lot of time each day within the workday to collaborate and work together through this virtual time. So uh, walk back what that means for a typical kindergartner through elementary school student, middle school and high school. Uh, how will it differ per grade level? So if I'm a third grade student, um, I will have instruction from um, 8.30 to I believe 11.30, then from 11.30 to 12.15, I'm going to be able to go um, and grab my grab and go lunch at my school with my family or with my siblings. Um, and then for 55 minutes after lunch, I'm going to be working on some independent learning from what was taught in the morning with my teacher. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to come in with synchronous learning with my teacher in the afternoon. And then the last hour of the day, I'll be able to receive some extra support either through counseling or intervention support or um, enrichment support. High school students are on a four by four block. So they have four periods. So their periods are longer in the day. Um, and they also have some um, uh, intervention times throughout their day as well. But each day um, there's also time for teachers to be working together. So uh, depending on the age level and the group um, life level of instruction, it, the instructional minutes differ, but in general, that's what a student's day will look like. Mm -hmm. And so th this question is for both uh, Superintendent Gordon and Superintendent Luna. What are your What are your biggest concerns starting this this fall, uh, knowing what we know now and knowing how it how it played out in the uh, in the spring? I'll start with you, Dave Gordon. My biggest concern is, is that uh, <clears throat> the district switched so, so quickly to distance learning that in many cases uh, they were not always reaching all kids because of uh, connectivity, difficulty in getting kids to sign on, a, a myriad of, of reasons. And the distance learning was, was not top of the line in many cases because of a lack of time to prepare. It was just not something that had been done on a large scale before. Uh, I, I'm anticipating a much better 
rollout of distance learning. This time, I think the districts, the 13 districts in our county have spent a lot of time trying to work through both the platform aspects of it, the connectivity aspects of it, but uh, more to the point, the, uh, the teacher engagement and the ability to better engage students, especially uh, the harder to reach students. That problem has not and, and will not go away. That's gonna be a work in progress to make sure we can reach each and every child as we should with a robust program, but people are working awfully hard to, uh, to be able to do that in, in every district. How about you, Superintendent Luna? The, the question was, what are your concerns uh, starting again this fall? Yeah, one of our greatest concerns is um, being able to address the needs of our most vulnerable students, our, our homeless students, our students who are in current conditions that are not conducive for learning. Um, as you know, many, many students, because our families have to work, many students end up being the caretakers of their siblings. So being um, distance learning, um, our older students are juggling other hats and responsibilities, not just for their own learning. So our biggest concern is while students are not in school, they are not in the most conducive environment for, uh, for their own learning. Thus, the gap of access, the gap of equitable access becomes greater um, in this in distance learning time. Mm -hmm. And how do we reconcile with families that just don't have resources? I mean, we, we have two kids at home right now, our fifth graders, and you know, we're struggling doing the Zoom calls and work and that we, you know, for the most part are figuring out our kids are pretty independent, but some families don't have that. They don't have the, the resources. So, and they, they, may, they may not even have uh, adequate internet service. They may have a hot spot that bounces people off, multiple kids in the, in the family. Um, and maybe, they have, maybe there's four kids in a school or go to school and, and they're sharing one computer. And so how, how do we, how do we match all that to make sure it works for every for the for all these families? Well, for Washington Unified, what we're going to do because we will not have in-person instruction on our campus, we are going to use our facilities to create uh, learning centers. Uh, you may have heard about this in San Francisco. They're creating learning hubs in different parts of the city for students to access technology, access the internet and just have a place where kids can safely be um, socially distanced, et cetera. But we will be doing that. Our hope is to do that on every campus, prioritizing that students without internet will have first place in on our campus in these learning centers. Also our uh, students who are homeless, even providing that access to our own employees when they have their students in our district uh, so that they can uh, fully have time to teach. Um, if they're choosing to teach in their classroom, uh, then their child um, in our programs can be in their learning center as well. We also want to acknowledge that there are many families who are single working parents. And while they go back to work, we also want to provide that space on our campuses for single working parents as well. So we are going to be addressing uh, that directly on our school campuses. Yeah, we will get into that issue of childcare a bit later. Um, I wanna talk now about uh, kind of um, training and preparing for this round. Um, in the spring, essentially teachers and families and everyone were just thrown into this with you know a few weeks uh, notification because of the of the crisis. Um, now we have a little bit more time to prepare. This is uh, we 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 knew about this you know two three weeks ago, which was mid July, and most schools start in late, later in August, so at least a month. And we've had knowledge of what we did and didn't do in the spring. So uh, what's happening and what's improved this round as far as training and preparing our our, our teachers? Um, you know, for example, in our in our we have twin kids, and they're they have two different teachers have always been in different classes. And one was very different than the other as far as um, availability and how much time with interaction. 
And so, you know, it, it, it was a work in progress. So I'll start with you, uh, uh, Linda Luna from Washington Unified in West Sacramento. What's happening this round as far as preparing our, our workforce, our teachers, our educators? Well, uh, Washington Unified is, has um, collaborated with the teachers union to move our start date back one week. So instead of starting August 12th, we're going to be starting August 19th. It's going to provide a full week of all day training, the 10th through the 14th for not just teachers, but for all staff, including our paraeducators and other classified staff to ensure we're all fully trained on uh, not just the health and safety practices expected during this time as we open the school year, but also uh, training for proficiency on the platforms being expected to be used during instruction. And it will also include a lot of collaboration time so that they will be able to share their planning and their resources. One of the things we heard in our community was the lack of consistency last spring, like you had just expressed, Assemblyman Member McCarty, where one student may be on more than another or have more time connected with their teacher. We're trying to um, make that much more consistent for engaging our students fully. Um, and so the teachers have agreed in a tentative agreement regarding how many minutes really the teachers are live and available with the with the students during the instructional day. So those are major changes. Um, in terms of curriculum, it's not enrichment. It's not just packets to be sent home like they were in the spring. Um, it is our standards aligned curriculum, our assessments that we would normally be using. It might, it's just going to be modified for uh, virtual use. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, as far as the, the teacher, Training and preparation this round. From yeah, Sacramento most County. most of our most of our districts are are doing a similar thing. Uh, a number of them have moved their starting dates back uh, a, a week or or a couple of weeks to allow for even more time. But most of them are doing uh, extensive training. Another thing, some of them have been setting up is help desks for the uh, for the families and the students to be able to check in to discuss both instructional problems or problems with the equipment or the, or the technology so they don't get stymied uh, for, a, for a whole day and miss a whole day of, miss a whole day of, uh, of instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, other thing I, the other thing I just wanted to, to mention is we have a big concern about the, uh, the mental health status of, of our young people, uh, many of whom uh, have not had an opportunity to see trusted teachers or counselors or coaches or drama teachers or, or whatever. So we're trying to work hard to make sure there is plenty of outreach from our counselors, school psychologists, uh, school social workers, uh, and others, uh, a number of our nonprofits in the community are ramping up to provide these services uh, as well, so that the the young people are not just online, but they're online and uh, and in in a good state of mind to be ready to learn. Okay, I'll have a, I have a few more prepared questions, then we'll get to the audience questions. Um, you know, it's been a struggle for a lot of people to to balance this with, you know, well, first of all, it's extremely difficult for people that are essential workers. They're, they're, you know, they work at a hospital, they work in retail, they work, you know, DoorDash or Amazon warehouse. So what do they do during the day? How, who's helping them? Many times their kids are at home potentially if they're a little bit older and who's helping them figure it out. That's, that's a dip challenge. But, but the people that are struggling with this balance I think parents, we've seen plenty of articles talking about it. They feel like, including people in my household, both of us, we're, we're failing being the teacher at here. You know, we're not the best teachers. I certainly respect my teacher more after this situation. Um, we are, you know, sometimes struggling at our, at our job, you know, doing our job and then, you know, just overall coordination and care. So it's certainly very stressful for everybody teachers, including students. 
Uh, what type of resources do you think would be available for parents to help figure it out? Well, we, we understand uh, the difficulty um, of not having the students in school for working parents. And that's why we are um, implementing these learning centers and also childcare facilities on our campus. We have partners that we work with, third party entities that help support us with childcare efforts. Um, so we're going to be implementing both learning centers for actual WUSD students and then um, childcare facilities for working families who would normally have them um, at school or um, in after school care uh, for pay for fee service. I think that's the most critical that we have heard from our parents um, of what to do with their students during the day while they have to go back to work and are being called back. We also are going to be offering parent universities throughout the year and we need to front load that before school starts. Guidance on what they should expect um, is going on with distance learning for their children, what kind of resources are available for them. Uh, we want to make sure that our families also have social emotional learning supports and resources and where to go for them um, with whatever struggles they're having at home as well. So it's ongoing. It's just not in the beginning, but I believe the child care and having kids in school um, is probably the biggest concern for our families. Mm -hmm. Dave? Uh, again, the... Uh... Uh, our website, the scoe.net, has a, a number of uh, valuable resources uh, which you which you can access there uh, around parent supports. Also, some tips about uh, trying to help your child actually engage with uh, distance learning and uh, and and with lessons. And I know all of our districts are working hard to be supportive in, in reaching out, as I said, to, to families and their young people, uh, both with social emotional supports, mental health supports, referrals, uh, and also uh, help with the, the process of engaging uh, distance learning. And, and, and also I think our districts really are open to uh, advice and suggestions from uh, from families as to how this can be done better. It's a work in progress. It will it will get better as as we go along. And I and I'll just say I'll just say one other thing. I think the uh, the teaching staffs are working awfully hard uh, under a difficult circumstance to to make this work. Uh, many of them have children of their own, and I think it's something where we we need to pull together as as a community and really work to support one another. And this, this will get better. The, the process will get stronger and hopefully we will be, be, be able to come back to in-person learning or at least some portion of in-person in learning uh, relatively soon. Okay. Um, before we, the final issue I wanna talk before we get to our community questions is about early education and, and uh, preschool and childcare. Uh, as you know, it's a big priority of mine as an assembly member, and I know both of you, I've been working with both of you to expand access for our families for pre-K and child care. And in California, as we know, it's, it's a little bit of mixed delivery. Some child care is our family child care homes. Um, some are actual centers. Um, some, are, um, some are done by uh, school sites. Um, and um, I know... I have my kids yelling in the background right now, so this is just a real world situation here. So um, what's happening as far as uh, West Sac, as far as your uh, district supported childcare and preschool preschool programs? For, for two, two reasons, one, to help our young kids become um, uh, ready, school age, uh, ready to succeed when they enter kindergarten, but also to help the families as they're looking to go back to work. Right. Preschool is often forgotten or often unspoken, but assumed. So thank you for asking this question specifically for preschool. Um, our preschool teachers, we want them engaged in training as well for virtual learning. Um, we have moved our preschool classes directly onto our school sites, our state preschool classes, so that they become 
and they already are a part of the school community itself, starting uh, with the preschool age. I think as the students are younger, it's much more difficult for them to maneuver distance and virtual learning. We're talking about three, four-year-olds, although if you ask my granddaughter that's two and a half, she can whip around a, t a computer pretty well. Um, but all that said, we also have to have a balance for our younger grades of preschool for uh, standards aligned uh, work packets and uh, curriculum resources that they would normally be using during the school year. And we would do the pickup uh, for their um, learning and work packets like we did in the spring. Only this start of school year, it would be their preschool actual curriculum. So I think the younger the grade, the younger the age, the more balance of maybe pencil and paper until they become more proficient with technology. Um, and you heard a little bit about our childcare. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, we also understand that in our learning centers and childcare, while it's going on during the school day, the students will be online with their teacher of record. So it's not like actual childcare, it's students will be on their computers learning from their teacher of record during the school day. It will just be held on our facility because of their special circumstance. Mm -hmm. Now, how about your child care programs? Uh, I know, child some, yeah. I know we, there's some center based through the district in the city of West Sac. Are those operating as as usual? Because, you know, we need that to help parents who are going back to work. Um, as we work with our, our city, they have been running even when, when school was closed. Um, the city uh, preschool or daycare uh, facilities under, of course, less numbers with the social distancing and 10 mm -hmm. students per adult. Um, and so ours will be the same as well. So we are working with our city partners for that. We have third party um, providers such as YMCA champions and then our city that helps us with these kinds of services. Okay. Uh, Dave, do you want to add anything here about pre-K and child care? Similar, similar, thing in, similar thing in Sacramento. A number of the districts uh, have child care providers operating in, uh, in, in their facilities. And, 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 and as you know, I'm a huge advocate for child care and, and preschool and, and believe we, we need to do uh, lots, lots more of it and build it into, into our budget as an expectation, not a uh, not an not an add-on. Okay, so we have a half hour down, half hour to go. Um, good conversation so far, and I realize that we have way more questions and answers, but we're trying to tackle some of the, the hot ones, especially as we families and teachers and students try to figure out what to do. When we get back. So this was this is a question from Rachel. She um, sent this earlier, and this was a question that we heard a lot during the spring as far as students with with um, special education needs. Um, and uh, what are we doing as far as online instruction this fall to make sure we take care of students with special needs, with special ed issues? Uh, well, in Washington Unified, uh, what we're, this is of course our biggest challenge uh, across the state. Um, we do expect to have annuals and triennial assessments of our IEPs and our annual 504 meetings. If, if our uh, parents and depending on the disability and the need, if it needs to be done in person, um, we want that to be um, a, a possibility. Of course, with the safety measures in place, doing a one-on-one -on -one assessment, we would have the plexiglass there, we would have um, assurances of the social distancing, of course. But there are some instances where you have to be in person in order to do the assessment um, to its uh, most authentic possibility. So we're looking at that. We are also looking to push in. And when we call it a push in model, that means instead of pulling kids out into special services, we're going to push in our paraeducators, we're going to push in our education specialists 
to be in the virtual classroom of, with their general education peers so that they're not pulled out missing any kind of their core instruction during the day as best as possible. Our last hour of every day is also designated to special services, whether it's an intervention class, whether it's an enrichment class, a special service, a counseling service, uh, we have designated the last hour of the school day for students to receive those services as well. Mm -hmm. So this is for you, uh, Dave Gordon. What are some of the lessons that we learn? I know you help coordinate education for, as you said, nearly 15 school districts. And so what are some of the lessons learned how we can improve helping our special ed students this fall? Well, I, I think the missing the in-person services uh, and the in-person assessments that need to be done, uh, as soon as we're able to reopen, the, the, one of the top priorities will be restoring all of those services, redoing the IEPs, uh, restarting the in-person services. Our severely handicapped uh, children, the families of our severely handicapped children where all of the services are in person, a lot of them are medical services as well. They haven't had services for three or four months and that's a huge loss for these families. So we're eager to get those services, get those services uh, restarted uh, as well. Uh, in addition, the social emotional support services, I think we, we will need more than ever uh, when we're when we're able to to reopen, and we're trying to work, as I said, work with our nonprofits uh, to begin doing that now to augment the school district services. But that will be that will be a big part of what we have to do is we have to make young people come back and feel comfortable and uh, talk through. We've done a number of focus groups with uh, young people, and we've debriefed them on what they think are some of the needs in coming back. And, and that youth voice has been tremendously valuable in thinking through how we're gonna pursue that. Okay, so now we're gonna bounce around for uh, other questions and there are no particular orders. So it may seem like we're going back to issues we already covered, but um, I think these are important issues. So this is a question we hear from, you know, frankly, everybody who's involved in schools is as far as moving past distance learning and getting back to the classrooms, there's a process. So um, can, can you repeat, what is it that, that, we, that we'll go through as far as determining when students will be allowed to return back to on-site learning? Um, yeah, I was gonna say, Superintendent Gordon, uh, if you wanna repeat, take that one, you've already gone through that, if you can go back to the phasing model. Yeah, basically for the reopening of all of the schools, meaning uh, elementary, middle, and, uh, and high schools, it will take the state getting off the monitoring list for a prescribed period of time, and then the public health officer uh, approving the plans the district has. Now, the districts pretty much have their plans in place, which they were ready to implement before the order came to uh, only do distance learning, so that, that's pretty much that's pretty much done. Uh, I will point out the the one health issue that is still outstanding, at least in Sacramento County, is the problem with turning around uh, testing in a timely fashion. And let me explain what the issue is there. Uh, all of these drive-by tests that uh, people can go and take for COVID, the backlog is such that those tests are taking six, eight, 10 days to be returned. Now, if you're, if you're running a school and you have a case which you have to investigate and then contact trace, you can't wait six, eight, 10 days for a response because you'll end up having to reclose the whole school. So we're working with the public health department to get a set of priority turnaround times for instances where there are cases that come up that need to be tested immediately so that cohorts of students who may be removed can be returned and you don't have a, 
a, a lot of people running around the schools who, who may have been exposed or, uh, or infected. So that's, that's a practical problem from the health side that our health people are really, really working on. So, so that would be something that uh, we have to nail down to make sure it's safe to, uh, to reopen. Okay. And you the elementary to... waiver, I also, uh, I also mentioned that would be subject to the same need around the, the availability of, of rapid return testing. And it's kind of premature for this issue because we're not in person yet, but you know, we were looking forward to doing the hybrid um, thing where our kids would go for a couple days a week and then do online at home. And so if that does hopefully come back as an opportunity in their future, and I understand too that parents um, well, they have a choice. They could do that or all, um, all online if they wished, if we did have the in-person come back. Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the anticipated requirements for kids in masks if we do this hybrid um, in-person and online for indoor education? Well, right now the, um, the guidance for students wearing masks is uh, students in third grade on up are required. And the guidance says students second grade and younger are highly recommended um, unless there is a medical condition um, that precludes a student from wearing a mask. Um, for adults, um, we're all in Washington Unified, we are requiring all adults to wear masks um, when they are located on their work site. Um, we do have um, some exceptions of if you're working by yourself, such as I'm by myself in my office right now, so I don't have my mask on. However, once I get up and I move outside of my office, I have to have my mask on. Um, and then that way we're assured uh, the safety of not just ourselves, but everybody else that is around us. So as of right now, those are the guidelines that we um, are implementing based on the guidance. Okay. Um, this is another uh, a question back to uh, teachers and preparation. This question is from a, an individual that says, how will teachers be held accountable to ensure they are actively engaging every student? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, um, that question probably comes from every single parent in our communities now, right? Because we know that we're all starting distance learning. The difference in accountability from spring in March when everybody closed to how we're going to start school, there's a few things that are different. One, we are held uh, to compliance of instructional minutes. So it, students have to have standards aligned instruction and learning activities in those instructional required minutes. The second is based on the agreements of each school district and their teacher um, employee groups, um, you have to come up with what that accountability looks like. And for Washington Unified, our teachers have agreed to and committed to being live. In other words, that doesn't mean that they're constantly talking live. It means that they are in the virtual room with their students during all instructional periods. So um, for a first to third grader, I think it's 230 minutes. So the teacher is live. So a stu students might be working on an assignment for 20 minutes. So during those 20 minutes, what that means is the teacher is available and in the room, in the virtual room, in case a student needs support or has a question, just like it would in the classroom, they would raise their hand and the teacher would then be able to uh, answer directly. That's the difference. When we closed in March, um, everybody was in crisis, including our teachers, because they had families to take care of. All of us did. And so now we have guidance from the CDE, from our health orders, and now we know what our instructional day uh, will look like based on all of those guidances. That's our accountability now. And it, it, it will be very different in that manner. Okay. 
Dave, do you want to add anything there or go on to the next question? No, that's, uh, that's, that's a very complete description. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, this question is relate, related to uh, TK and, and EK, so it's transitional kindergarten and early kindergarten programs. It says, will families be contacted in time to ensure they have the te technological capacity to participate on day one of distance learning? Um, in our district, we um, are ensuring that whoever needs a device will receive a device. And so our, our principals will be reaching out to the families like they did in March um, to find out who is in need of a device. And um, we had uh, device pickups, uh, Chromebook pickup days uh, for families who needed it. And we image it according to that student and the checkout system accordingly. So TK and preschool will be included in, uh, in those for Washington Unified. Okay. And for, uh, for any other district that you're in, if you haven't been contacted by now, please contact the district yourself because the opening days are, uh, are fast approaching. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. I have, a, I have a couple just general education questions for, for you. So big picture, as both of you know, I, I chair the budget committee overseeing school funding. So we had a difficult task this past summer of balancing a state budget dealing with a $50 billion multi-year gap because of decreased revenue coming in with COVID-19. So we, you know, our prior number one was to keep district funding whole for this current year and the next year. Uh, if we don't get federal money, we may have to have deferrals. So that's just deferring money you would get from one year to the next. Um, one of the things that we did was really some, it's proving to be somewhat controversial is we had, which we think is a smart thing, we had a, a called a hold harmless provision where we keep monies for every district um, whole. And that's important for Linda over there, you and your district and Dave throughout the districts throughout Sacramento, you know, to keep their budgets afloat. And that's if they don't have students coming because of ADA issues with COVID-19 or other costs, we wanna keep those districts um, stabilized. Um, but there are districts that in schools that are growing that um, if we, you know, by definition, if you have a hold harmless and keep and put a draw a line in the sand to keep all districts uh, have stability of funding based on a certain day, let's say a year ago in 2019, then as districts grow, then there's not money for the growth. And so there's some charter schools who are online charter schools who are really concerned about that. And there's some regular school districts like up in Thomas or Elk Grove where there's growing communities. I'm not sure about West Sac. Um, so I wonder if you can enlighten me if that's a, a conversation that's come up uh, and, and uh, what's happening on, on this issue. Well, for West Sacramento, we uh, appreciate and are grateful for the hold harmless language. Um, right now, families are struggling. And families are having to make very difficult choices um, regarding their own finances, their own well being, and what it looks like during the day for not just themselves as adults, but also for their children. So the hold harmless allows us to move forward, knowing how to manage our budgets, knowing that we can continue to serve the students um, that we have now. Um, and also work, continue to work on our recruitment. Um, I would be, not be honest if I didn't say that um, school districts like Washington Unified have to work on recruitment. We've got charter schools all over around us. Uh, so that said, it's important to work on your own programs, retaining our own families by providing choices and opportunities and services that are pertinent to the community for Washington Unified, it's about daycare, it's about childcare, and it's about quality of programs. And that's what we're committed to working on. So Hold Harmless is important to us. 
so that we can really focus on the important things of our quality of program and instruction. I will also say that the COVID-19 monies uh, that are coming in specifically to help us address all of these additional costs um, are, are life-saving to school districts as well. And, and Dave, maybe I'll ask you a slightly different question. Are, are we, you, do you see an a increase in families leaving our, our public schools looking for other options during COVID-19? Um, uh, not, not so far, but, but coming back to the question of the, the hold harmless is, is appreciated because in the current budget crisis, it's a stabilizing factor for districts and allows them to plan. But for the districts you mentioned in Sacramento County, uh, Elk Grove, Natomas, and Folsom Cordova, having support for the growth is vitally important because what it means is a cut to the programs for the rest of the kids if the, if the growth isn't supported. So, so that would be something that we'd really encourage the legislature and governor to, uh, uh, to, to look at. Yeah, what we're looking at there, um, not to get in the weeds for people who are watching at home on other topics, we'll get to those um, more general questions in a bit, is planned growth versus um, COVID growth. In other words, if there is a district exactly. like El Grove or Natomas or, or West Sac, th those communities have new home development and you know new neighborhoods and so they're planning expansion and so that is planned growth but some of these other education type entities mainly they're charter schools and they're the non-in-person charter schools online charter schools they're having a surge in people signing up because of COVID-19 that families maybe aren't aren't satisfied with the online education at Sac City or Washington or whatever school district and they're calling these folks. And so, um, you know, there's only so much money to go around. So we had to make a tough choice in, in order to hold harmless and keep proper funding for the 15 districts in Sac Sacramento County and, and over there in Yolo with Washington, we had to make a choice. And so money doesn't grow on trees. I like to say in my budget committee, there's no uh, tooth fairy to pay for these things. And so um, while they raise a good point, we only have so much, so much resources to go, so many resources to go around. So let me ask some other questions. This is a general question that you probably get there as someone leading a district, a specific one, and that's uh, school sports. I know it's extremely frustrating. Um, our kids' little league season, uh, girls' softball season was canceled this summer. They keep trying to come back and running, running into all kinds of roadblocks with our school district and their fields out there. So um, what's happening with school sports over in West Sac at Washington Unified? Well, we, um, of course, keeping uh, safety and health as our number one priority, it is very disappointing to our students and our families uh, to have to postpone sports uh, for this fall. As you know, CIF came out um, on, on a Monday saying that all fall sports will be pushed out uh, into the spring season. And then the next day they said, well, wait a minute, we we're, we're not sure. We might be able to open some of them. So right now um, we're, we are going to be on the cautious side and we are, um, until our COVID cases in West Sacramento settle down, and start to decrease, we're going to hold off on our athletic programs right now um, because the fall sports, we were talking about football. Um, and even if we start at basketball, I mean, those are the sports that you're just not able to manage right now during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, you have anything to add about sports? Yeah, I, I would just I would just add the the fact that it's uh, it's it's very, very disappointing and very, very hard to take away in, in my career. I, I can't tell you how many young people I've seen who were at school solely because of sports and they bonded with with a coach or or coaches. And, and those were the most influential people in uh, in in their lives. And those people are still there. And, and we're hoping they're still able to be connecting with kids, but 
Uh, sports is a huge loss, as are other things that may not be able to be run like bands or drama uh, or whatever. So I think restoring those things is a huge, huge mm -hmm. priority. CIF, is, as uh, Superintendent Luna said, has, has tried to plan to push back all of the fall sports into the winter and run the other sports up through the spring. But hopefully, uh, hopefully that can, those things can come back as quickly, as quickly as it's safe to do so because they are so instrumental in the development of young people and, and really, really the social and emotional health of young people. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's ask some other questions here. Here's an interesting one. As far as, um, especially this is says for high school, but it could be for a middle school and others, um, what about other enrichment type of classes activities can be offered for, for students? So in our high school programs, um, we Superintendent Gordon had just talked about the sports, which is a huge um, in, enrichment activity that is in the heart of many of our high school students. While our electives are we still remain, on our on our courses and our in our schedules for high school, it is going to be more difficult, such as band instruction, such as orchestra instruction. But it is possible. Um, a, as a musician myself, it is difficult to engage in these kinds of activities. Um, I'm in a choir myself, and, and believe me, virtual choir is extremely difficult. Um, but it is possible. So we we know that these are the classes. That, that motivate and connect our students to school in a very deep and different way to enhance their regular instruction of their core classes. So we have to stay committed to electives our students have these electives um, and other enriching courses that they would normally have during the school year. So we are still offering them for the high school schedules. The only one that we're having a difficulty implementing will be the sports and the athletic programs. Okay, um, here's a question about, about substitute teachers. Uh, what's the role of substitutes during this uh, COVID-19 online education era? Well, we're going to have to do a lot of training for our substitutes, far more than uh, we have ever done in our past. A substitute teacher cannot just come in and um, know, know the teacher's platforms, know um, the manner, the, the small intimate details of how the classroom teacher connects to the students online. Um, and so this is um, going to have to be a project in itself. First, finding enough substitutes because we always have a difficult time having enough substitutes during the school year. But also secondly, ensuring that there is a base of skill sets that a substitute may be able to enter into a teacher's virtual world. Um, our teachers have been working countless days and hours. Some of people have been working all summer and do expect a substitute to step in uh, overnight or even in that morning to pick up where the teacher left off is, is, un, is almost impossible. We're going to have to give them training at a much different level. Mm -hmm. and that will take resources because we're gonna have to pay them to come in and spend more days with us. Um, but that's the only way it's going to be able to work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what would you tell both of you for, um, for, for parents and for students uh, based upon what we saw in the spring, um, uh, advice for them as far as how to get organized and how to, how to succeed when we start online education in a couple weeks? And I'm taking uh, particular uh, notes from my family as well, so. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Dave Gordon. We'll start with you. Okay. Well, I think I think number one, I I would really try to get familiar with the learning platform that your your young people are using, uh, the curriculum, what what the uh, 
teacher will be working on with them, uh, not so much how, so you can help them specifically on the material, but, but so that you can support them in trying to plan their time and put the work in that's necessary and spread the work out. So they're comfortable going through all of the work that's, that's put before them in a day at home. I know with, with many of our young people, organizing their time is, is a problem and that's something you can help them with. But overall, I think uh, as a parent or, or grandparent, it's just most important that you be there for them and support them and, and help them understand how difficult the situation is for everybody in our community and how we will get through it and how uh, schools will open, sports will come back, the, the regular, the regular uh, gatherings will come back and uh, just try to keep, keep up their spirits and, and uh, tell them better days, better days are to come, but that we have to hang together uh, and get through this together. Yeah, I, I think I would, um, in value adding to Superintendent Gordon's suggestions, the learning environment at home, the best that it can be, um, will be extremely helpful to the students. So making sure the student has a place to be able to use their device at a table or at a desk, um, without the TV on, things like that. If there is some kind of a structure in that manner conducive for learning. But secondly, what I, I would, would say is that we want our parents to be parents. We, our kids need our parents to be the parents and not the parent and the teacher of the classroom. Mm -hmm. The distance learning will be different in that the teacher will be there with the student now. We've put the structures in place. We have guidelines that we all now have that we didn't have before. So if we are struggling at home, if a student is struggling, it's imperative the parent reach out. Reach out to the teacher, reach out to the administration so that we can be there to help you so that you can support your child as a parent and let us help you and support you um, in the education part of it. And all three of those uh, parts of the triangle, the student, the parent, and uh, the school, the teacher, uh, will then help it to be a successful learning experience. Okay, well, those were some good words of wisdom for uh, families and for parents and for students. So do you have any other uh, parting comments or, or, or ideas as far as how we're gonna get through this from the big picture, either of you? Togetherness and kindness, because nothing will be perfect. And so kindness goes a long way um, because we are committed to improving and getting better along the way, along this journey. And it's only through togetherness. And I know that sounds kind of corny, but really we will be far better together than um, alone. So just know that our schools are here to do that for our families. Dave Gordon. Yeah, I, I would just add to, uh, to really, uh, take care to follow the advice of our health leaders and our health professionals. Fight, fighting this battle is going to take all of us doing our part to, to wear the mask, to, to follow the instructions. It's hard, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable, it's difficult, but that's the thing that will turn these uh, case trends around and, and, and eventually get us to a place where we have a vaccine and, and, we, and we can get out of this. But uh, uh, the health people are working very, very hard as well. And they're, they're giving the best scientific advice that they possibly can. And, and, and we have to work with them and, and pay attention. Okay, well, thank you uh, so much for enlightening us today. And uh, first of all, we know that education is so critical to our future. We have 6 million kids in public schools here in California. And these kids are our future. They're our, you know, frankly, our present and our future. 
and uh, we need to make sure that we we do this right. And there are no easy answers, but we're just you know trying to get through this. And I think that we learn a lot from the spring, and we're we're trying to make sure that we can step it up in the fall as well. So uh, thank you all for participating today. I know we couldn't get to all of your um, questions, but we tried to um, you know get to and generalize as many as we can. And thanks again to Superintendents uh, Luna and Gordon for participating today. Thank and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.